Good morning. Thank you for having me. So I have the great good fortune to work at a moonshot factory. Our moonshot factory is attached to a very large and powerful technology company in Google and Alphabet. But I hope by the end of this talk, you will leave convinced that moonshot thinking is not just for those big, rich technology companies, and it's actually something that all of us can bring to our jobs, to our teams, to our organizations every day. Think back to when you were seven or eight years old. At the time, you thought you could be or do anything, an astronaut, an actor, a ballerina, Many children, many of us, wanted to help people. We thought we could be the ones to bring world peace, to cure diseases. We had incredibly ambitious visions to, uh, <laughs> to do whatever it was, go to a galaxy far, far away, solve poverty, solve homelessness. But then something happens. Where does that spirit that we had when we were children to ask, what if, why not, why not now, why not me, where does that go? All of a sudden, we wake up one day and we say, mm, well, that's just life, or, hmm, poverty, that's a very complicated systems problem. We go into organizations where we say things like, under promise and over deliver. We, we are told, walk before you run. We worry about spooking our shareholders. And that eternal favorite, what's my boss going to think? And to a certain extent, this is all natural. This is human nature talking. But is it any surprise that many of us wake up as fully formed grown-ups, crushed by organizational habit, Lay, you know, our souls are layered under, you know, essentially existential crud. Well, I'm going to try to convince you we can get rid of that existential crud. And I know we can because I work at a place where people wander the hallways all day, every day, asking, why not? What if? Why is this so broken? Why can't we fix that? Let's go figure that out. We can do it. So X is a moonshot factory. Our mission is to invent and launch new technologies that will make the world, we hope, a radically better place. And we call ourselves a moonshot factory quite deliberately. The two words each matter. So moonshots, are that's inspired by the 1960s space race to put a man on the moon, representing that seemingly impossible dream that if we could just do it, would be amazing. And then factory, equally important, we're trying to build a repeatable process where we can generate innovative ideas over and over. And that's really about the culture. It's about finding just the right mix of, of process and mindset so that we can all get out of bed every day over and over, a whole different mix of teams working on a bunch of projects, which I'll talk to you about. We can do this repeatedly, hopefully for years and years to come. And that mindset is actually something all of you can borrow. I want you to steal this from us. So let me tell you a little bit about how we uh, go about choosing our moonshots. So because we're a technology company, our moonshots have technology at the core, but there are plenty of moonshots that need to be taken, that have been taken in other areas. Uh, Gandhi's Salt March, uh, the fight for civil rights in the US, Goodness knows we need some more moonshots and everything from climate change to, to inequality. The list, the list goes on. But our three ingredients are essentially these. First, we start with a huge problem in the world, a problem that affects millions, even billions of people. Then we name a solution to that problem, something that probably sounds like it came out of science fiction. But if we could solve that, then that problem might go away, or at least get a lot better. Lastly, we have to be able to point to a new technology. Perhaps it only exists today in a research paper or in a very rough prototype in a lab somewhere, but the, its existence today gives us a glimmer of hope that that radical solution could actually be achieved within the next five to 10 years. So this is how we think of our, our foundations every time we start a project. But I will also note, we're not just doing this for fun. 
We have to produce businesses. One of the most deeply held principles at Google is that we can have both purpose and profit. I know there's been a lot of profit over the years, and we are trying to, to put it to, to good use. But we're trying to build real businesses because we believe that to have that really sustainable impact on those huge world problems, you can't be in a situation where you need to just keep pump money into it year after year. It has to be sustainable economically on its own. So I'm going to give you a few examples that, that fit these three circles in our blueprint. So the one that you might be most familiar with is self-driving cars, which is now Waymo. Huge problem, 1.2 million people die on the world's roads every year. How do we live with that? That's like a, a full airplane dropping out of the sky every weekday. It's just not something we should accept as, oh, that's just life. So, we went after the radical solution, cars that drive themselves, and the breakthrough technology, which was truly breakthrough at the time, almost 10 years ago when this project started, was sensors and software that could detect the world around the vehicle and help the vehicle navigate safely. So right now in, in the state of Arizona and the United States, there's several hundred people who take a fully driverless Waymo vehicle to work and school every day. Just last week, the state of California cleared the way for fully driverless testing. So I'm hoping that someday soon we can say no one has to die on the roads because of human error or other, other issues. Project Loon. You might have heard about this uh, slightly loony idea to bring internet to the unconnected. We started working on this back in 2011 when more than two-thirds of the world's population uh, didn't have internet access. At the time, people had forgotten that this was still an issue because most of the people with money, with means, we were sitting with maybe not the best Wi-Fi in the world, but it really wasn't a day-to-day -day issue. So it was something that the world had sort of decided, oh yeah, yeah, that'll get fixed. That eventually, Wi-Fi, cell towers, fiber optic cable, it'll get us there. Not true. Even today, only 45% of the world is connected. And, so, and that probably still leaves a lot of people lacking affordable, reliable connections. So we asked the what if question, what if you could rise up above all the terrestrial hassles of bringing connectivity to people and instead fly balloons on the stratospheric winds and, and beam internet down and have the balloons fly such that as one flies away, a new one rolls in uh, to take its place. So last year, the Loon team was able to help hundreds of thousands of people after flooding in Peru destroyed terrestrial infrastructure, and after Hurricane Maria uh, destroyed infrastructure in Puerto Rico, and they continue to test in places around the world. What about how we move goods around? There, should be some, there must be some improvements there. We probably all take for granted that we can pop to the shops to get whatever we need. But if roads near you are washed out by, by weather, by mudslides, or if you live in a city that's just you know, jam-packed with traffic, or maybe, maybe you've questioned, you know, when you order that takeout dinner, uh, do you really need to move a two-pound box of food in a 5,000-pound gas-guzzling vehicle? What if instead you could use drones to deliver small goods? We're testing this in Australia in a small community outside of Canberra. And how about energy? The Makani team asked the question, what if you could, instead of building wind turbines out of thousands of pounds of concrete and steel, instead you could build something that looks a lot like an airplane that flies in loops and has propellers down the wings and spins the propellers and sends electricity down a tether to the ground. What if that could enable us to collect wind energy from places like you know, offshore areas or mountainous regions where the wind is, is strong and reliable? These are all questions that the engineers at X have asked, and there's many more at home in the secret lab. But for the next few minutes, I want to give you some tips that you can hopefully take back to your organizations, because the mindset here is applicable. I, a lot of you last night self-identified as troublemakers, so these are your tips. <laughs> so first, aim for 10x, not 10%. Aiming to solve a problem in a way that's 10x better rather than 10% better is going to get people's hearts going in a way that 10% better just can never do. 
Cancer sniffing nanoparticles? Heck yeah, I'm there. Space elevator? Sure, no problem. Anything less than that, it just feels like another day at the office. But the real advantage of 10x thinking is that it forces you to set aside existing assumptions and tools and just start over. If you're going to make a car that can get $500, 500 miles off a, a gallon of gas, you can't go with a, a something that looks like a current car. You have to start over. The Makani team, that energy kite was essentially invented by a bunch of windsurfers who were really passionate about climate change. Their naivete brought them a fresh perspective that they might not have had if they were conventional wind industry engineers. The Loon team knew nothing about balloons. Instead, they wondered, can we use software to lightly help the balloons navigate on the stratospheric winds? They probably wouldn't have come up with that if they were more conventional technologists in that space. So that naivete and that, that incredible spirit like unleashes bravery and creativity. Second, we coach our teams to fall in love with the problem they're trying to solve, not the technology that they've built or the approach that they think is right. This is a particular challenge with technologists who made that awesome thing and they love their awesome thing, and, but what if there's a better idea just around the corner? What if someone else on the team has a different idea? So we have a word for this, or a phrase for this. We tell our teams to be passionately dispassionate. So passionate about solving the problem that you will run through walls to get it done, and you become a deep expert in all of its roots and complexities. But dispassionate enough that you can remain intellectually honest about different ways to get there and not fall in love too hard with a particular way of doing things if a better option shows up. And this, is, this includes asking teams to kill their projects altogether, which is incredibly difficult. We only have so much budget available to take so many moonshots. That means if something's just not working, we need to be ready to move on to other things. But you have to, as leaders in an organization, make sure that folks feel really, really comfortable about that. And so we, when we, so Kathy Hannon, who's, who's on the slide here, she was an exemplary example uh, of a team that was trying to um, turn seawater into fuel. Uh, and it's actually going to be the subject of my masterclass tomorrow morning. They managed to make the fuel but the real world started getting in the way. And so Kathy was able to lead this team in this remarkably clear-eyed way where they, it was the team that was convinced they were going to change the world. But as they were running into problems, they managed to stay passionately dispassionate. And all the way through the process, and with other teams that have been in difficult positions, we make sure that those team members get celebrated at our team all hands, we make sure that they get promoted, we make sure they get vacations, and in cases where they have to vote to end their project, we make sure that we help them find their role on their next moonshot. So these are all really important cultural elements of making sure that you can bring bravery and creativity into your organization. My next tip. Okay, failing fast, complete Silicon Valley cliche. I'm sick of it. <laughs> we don't like to fail. What we like to do, what we love to do, is learn. When you are building things that have never existed in the world before, you can't just make a list of the things to do to make it work. There, you couldn't make a list of 100 things to do to make a car drive itself. You have no choice but to just get out there and start trying things. So this image is from a, um, a climate chamber. It's, a, it's 60 degrees below zero, and this is actually in Florida. This is one of the loon balloons, and they take the loon balloons into these unimaginable conditions to, to torture them and learn all the ways that they could possibly fail. The Loon team has gone through countless designs, countless balloons over the years. And I imagine that every time they came up with a new design, like they had one that was a really ugly trash bag, they had some that were you know, sort of spherical and silver and looked like an alien pod. Uh, they had really long ones the size of a blue whale that were clear and cool. Well, that's not what our balloons look like today. Right now they look like giant pumpkins about half the size of this room, if you can believe that. So all along the way, 
every design that didn't work out was technically a failure, and it could have cost these, these teams quite a bit of emotional pain and anxiety to keep failing, but instead we were able to get them to see that this was necessary learning on the way to the future. Next tip, the importance of making contact with the real world. These monkeys are on the slide because they are currently tormenting one of our teams. So we have a team testing internet connections uh, in rural India, and the team went out into the jungle with, you know, carefully specced uh, boxes ready to beam internet across these jungle valleys. They were prepared for heat and fog and dust and dampness, and then they met the monkeys. And even though that team was really good at planning things, no one predicted the monkeys. The monkeys really enjoyed jumping up and down on <laughs> these boxes. Moreover, these monkeys are extremely territorial. So not only did the team have to redesign the boxes for monkey jumping, but they also had to uh, update their maintenance procedures and timelines around when the monkeys enjoy hanging out on the box. Uh, so no matter how smart you are, you have to go out and actually learn uh, from the real world what's, long, what's wrong with your idea. Almost done. Uh, this is actually an expansion on the idea of the importance of making contact with the real world. People fall in love with their ideas and they also want to show up, especially to the outside world, with something that is perfect. I tell my teams to fight that urge because there's so much learning available out there and instead aim for something that I refer to as version zero dot crap. So some of you in the software world might know you hear th version one, version 1.5, version two. This is essentially version rubbish. That frees people from their worry of going out with something that looks a little janky and broken. And guess what? The world is gonna reward you, I promise, for showing up with something a little janky and saying, please help me make it better. It's really important to go to your users, partners, policymakers, other people who have lots of ideas for how this could get better. And I would argue that this is the message that the technology industry needs to hear most deeply and start acting on, because we cannot continue to simply foist technology upon society. Instead, it must be a collaborative effort. And lastly, we have to build teams that represent all different types of perspective and expertise. There's a myth in Silicon Valley that someone will come down from the mountain with a vision, with the answer for what the future will look like. The world isn't changed by individuals. The world is changed by teams working together. And we have, we, when we put together teams at X to solve these huge world problems, we bring together people, sure, with conventional technology backgrounds, but we also have firefighters and fashion designers and people from all sorts of, of countries and, and backgrounds. And that is how we succeed in making the world a radically better place. So I will leave you with two thoughts, two questions, really. What is your moonshot, and why not you? Thank you.